Kanasti, how are ye? We're Candle at Tales, we're lighting a candle and telling a tale. So let's light her up. Well, we're Candle at Tales. I'm Aaron, I'm sitting down with my sister Sorka. I'm Sorka. Uh, so in our last podcast, we heard a recording of a live show we did in Whelan's, the story of the Tawn Bo Kunle, which is a, a rollicking epic and a jolly tale. Uh, I lie, it's <sighs> really tragic. Rollicking epic. <laughs> That's not even remotely <laughs> like what that is. Anyway, this time we're going to hear some, well, one of the Prev Schkelte, the background stories that fill out that story. So, like, you don't need to have heard that story, but, you know, go back and listen to it if you want. It's there, not podcast one and two. And this yep. time we're going to look at Deirdre of the Sorrows. Yes, and this is a slightly, this is one of the longer stories that we're going to be telling. This is about as long as they get, I think, when we're doing it this way. So, you know, settle in. Settle in. Um, It's also a new way for us to play with telling stories. So this time you might have heard my voice is a little bit feggered. Um, that's a new word I made up. <laughs> Not a word. It's, 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 it's figured. It's a new word. And uh, that's because I have a forever cold. It's going on for about a month. But a shout out to Tara Clark in Westport who told me to get some carrageen. Oh, you're seaweed, lads. Just, you, you, you don't bring it to boil. Just leave it in the pot. Stew it. And it turns gelatiny. Throw in turmeric or turmeric or how do you pronounce that anyway? Ginger, lemon. The way you pronounce it is Aaron is now off on one about how he, how he keeps from dying of cold. I mean, like, it's the cure to man flu. <laughs> it needs to be this needs to be spread out there like carrageen just don't eat the actual seaweed it's, but it's it's actually carrageen but you know car- car- it is car- there's an a there's no, it's not there's no or uh, anyway so i'm going to shut up now because uh i'm going to get my sister to do what she basically did for the first 12 years of my life slash still doing tell me stories uh and before we we get on to that if any of you like hearing these stories you can find us on Patreon and you can support us and we would really appreciate your help in keeping these stories going. Become our pat- patron on Patreon. I, th- I can never get that joke right. No. It's not a good joke. I'm going to stop it, doing it. You should stop doing it. This is a really sad story, by the way, so <laughs> we should stop like having a really giddy intro. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's too late now. Um, we're not redoing really it. Okay, enjoy. So this story starts in the house of Phelan the Harper. He was the storyteller of Ulster, you see. And he and his wife were having a celebration. Because they had kind of given up on the idea of having kids, to be honest. And they were getting on in years. They just thought it wasn't going to happen for them. But Phelan's wife was pregnant. And so he invited the king, the young king, Crohor Macnessa, who was not long into his kingship. And he was a very young man when he ascended which is another story for another time. He invited Crohor and the Red Branch to his house. And while they were there, the Druid Kaffa, he was called on to give a prophecy about what kind of a life this child would have. And so he went to Phelan's wife and he put his hand on her belly. And inside the belly of the pregnant woman, the child screamed and silence fell on the hall. And Kaffa then spoke up into that silence, and he said, This child would be a girl, and her name would be Deirdre, and she would be beautiful beyond compare, but an excess of anything is deadly, and her beauty would cause such suffering, such strife and such fighting among men wherever she went that more men would die on account of her than were alive in that hall on that day. Now, at this, the Crave Rua, the warriors of Ulster, they put their hands on their swords. They said it would be better to kill the child unborn than suffer the fate that Kaffa had laid out for them. But Crohor, being a young king, he wanted to show compassion. He wanted to set the tone for the kingship that he was going to have, a just and an idealistic king. So he stayed their hands and he said, no, we'll not kill this child. Instead, 
let her be taken into the wilds and into the wilderness. And when she's of age, after she's raised up out of the sight of anyone who might harm her, I will marry her myself. And I'll put her in such a high position that no man will dare challenge me for the hand of Deirdre. And that was just what happened. Now, Crohor chose Lowercom, a bard and satirist of Ulster, to raise the child Deirdre in the loneliest valley in Ulster. A tiny, faraway place tucked away and tucked further away into the hillside behind a hidden door with a little cabin where Lowercom went to raise the baby Deirdre. Now, Deirdre grew up in those hills. Far away from other people, far away from other children, far away from anyone who might lay eyes on her, be tempted by her, even when she was still a child. And Lowercom raised her and educated her, as befitted a woman who would be Queen of Ulster when she came of age. And all went well. Deirdre liked the wilderness. She liked solitude and silence, which was lucky because that was what she had. And then a day came, and it was a late winter day, while the snow was still on the ground, and a calf had just been slaughtered to provide meat for Lowercombe and Deirdre. And Deirdre, Deirdre watched. She watched as a raven flew down and pecked at the snow that had been bloodied with the spilled blood of the slaughtered calf. And she went pale then, Now, Lowercom thought that she was maybe soft-hearted at seeing the calf killed, but that was not it. Young Deirdre turned to Lowercom and she said, I have seen the colours of the man that I will marry. Raven black on his hair, snow white on his body, blood red on his cheeks. Now, Deirdre had always been able to get her own way from Laracombe because she was just so pretty and she was so cute and she had a way of nagging and she had a way of cajoling and she had a way of getting out of Laracombe whatever it was she wanted and Laracombe just couldn't resist her. But when Laracombe heard Deirdre say this, she felt a chill. Because Crohor MacNessa, the King of Ulster, was a very handsome man, but he was fair-haired and ruddy-cheeked. And there was a man in Ulster of the description Deirdre had given, and he was not Crohor. Now, Deirdre clocked this, because when you grow up with exactly one person in your life, you get to read them pretty well. And so... She realised that Laracombe knew the man she was talking about and she set about trying to get her to spill. And and Laracombe just held firm. She just wouldn't. She just, nope, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't do it. Uh, But Deirdre, she, she nagged, she pleaded, she cajoled, she flattered, she cried, she did all of the tricks in her arsenal. And finally, finally, Laracombe gave in and told her that there was one man in Ulster who had those colours on him and his name was Nisha. And he was the eldest of the sons of Ishnuk, great warriors of the Crave Rua. Now they were so great that if all the men of Ulster fell and only the sons of Ishnuk remained, it was said that they would be able to hold any army at bay. They were lions in the fight. They hunted together in the woods, singing in three-part harmony as they went. And Laracombe then decided to try and get Deirdre on board with what was actually going to happen in the future. She said, you know, you're going to meet Nisha and all the other warriors of Ulster on your wedding day to the king. Yay! Deirdre was not excited at this news. 
She had no interest in marrying a king. What was a king to her? She'd grown up in a cave. And so Deirdre didn't react exactly the way Larrican had hoped. She still begged Larrican, but this time she'd changed her tune. Now she wanted Larrican to arrange for her, for Deirdre, to have a glimpse of Nisha. And she swore that she'd, she'd let it go. She'd let it go after Larrican, just, just let her saw Nisha. Now, Larrican, very much against her better judgment, eventually was worn down. She went to the sons of Ishnok and she told them that there was great hunting to be had in a certain little hidden valley in the wilds of Ulster and Deirdre went out to wait. Now, she'd promised Larrican that she'd uh, she'd hide and she wouldn't speak to them but as soon as she saw Nisha all of that went out the window and Deirdre jumped out from her hiding place and ran to him. And Nisha stopped in his tracks to see this woman because she was breathtaking. He had never seen anybody who looked like that because nobody had ever looked like that and nobody has since. She was Deirdre. She was stunning. And she stunned him. And she kind of didn't know what to say because she'd never met a man before. But she blurted out, run away with me. Now, Nisha clocked who she was because he was not an idiot and uh, he'd heard the story of the Harper's daughter who was going to grow up to be really beautiful and was being kept by the King of Ulster. And so he said, uh, no, it, absolutely not. That you're, you're obviously Deirdre. Crahor uh, would be incredibly angry if I ran away with you. I just won't. And then Deirdre said, I'm going to put a gesh on you, so you have to run away with me. Now, a gesh is a, a magical prohibition or a promise that can be put on someone. And it means that if you break it, disaster and doom will follow. And this was something that everyone in ancient Ireland knew to be true. And so when Deirdre said that to Nisha, he had no choice. He had to run away with her. He tried to persuade his brothers, Anla and Ardon, to stay behind, but they wouldn't be parted from him. And they didn't go back to Awanmaka because they knew how furious the king would be. They knew he'd hunt them to the ends of the earth. And so they fled across Ireland. And sure enough, when Crahor heard that Nisha had run away with Deirdre, this beautiful girl who he'd been keeping for himself, he was absolutely furious. He sent out messengers. He sent out hunters. He tracked them relentlessly until eventually they fled again across the sea to High Hill Alban. Now there they entered the service of the King of Scotland, the King of Alban, and they fought at the front of his armies, but every night after the fight, they would just leave. They'd just, the three brothers would just disappear into the wilderness. And the king became very curious about this, and he had a messenger follow them one evening. And the messenger reported back that they had fled back to the most beautiful woman he had ever seen, who was keeping a little camp for them out in the wilderness. Now, this messenger suggested to the king of Scotland that this woman would be a fine bride for a king. And so the king started putting the sons of Ishnuk to the forefront of every battle that was ever fought in the hopes that they would die. But they were too brilliant. They were better warriors than anybody else alive. And they were amazing. And they survived. But they also worked out what was going on. And they fled once again. They took Deirdre and they ran into the wilderness. And this was properly the wilds of Alban with nothing but mountains and lochs and fens and the wild deer and the sons of Ishnok and Deirdre and their hounds. And there they lived in perfect peace. Now, back in Ulster, well, there'd been a little bit of a fallout from the exile of the sons of Ishnok. You see, a lot of the warriors, well, they missed them. They were wonderful warriors and they were great friends with many of the men. 
And so there was a bit of grumbling that Crowhorn McNessa had taken this so much amiss, this running off with Deirdre. And Fergus McRoy, who was married to Crowhorn's mother and had been the former King of Ulster, which is another other story. Well, Fergus went to Crowhorn and, and kind of try to work on him a little bit you know would he not forgive the sons of Ishnuk and he, he'd look awful good if he could if he could just let it go and let the lads come back and he'd really be seen as a generous king and everyone knows generosity is the most important thing to be and would he would he not just you know just leave it go just just for the sake of you know the lads and the harmony and what not Crowe didn't much like this but he also had to concede that Fergus had a point. It it didn't look great. It wasn't a great look, this old jealous king. You know, he quite liked his status as being the young hot king. You know, who's, who the women of Ulster forbade him from wearing a long tunic so they could look at his legs all year round. That was kind of his image. And so this was really going against that. And so he thought about it and he, he, he eventually thought, all right, okay, I'm going to kind of let it go. But there was another half of him that was still full of jealousy and rage. So he went back to Fergus and he said, um, OK, I've been thinking about what you said. And uh, what would you do if the sons of Ishna came back and somebody killed them? And Fergus said, well, if they were under my protection... I'd kill any man who would kill them. Unless, of course, that man were you, because you're my king. And Crohor said, Good answer. Now, he sent Fergus off to bring the sons of Ishnuk back. And he went back to thinking about this, turning it over in his mind, because he still wasn't quite sure what he was going to do when he saw them. Over in High Hilled Alban, Nisha and Deirdre were playing a game of Fitchel, an Irish version of chess. And they heard a shout ringing out through the hills. Nisha pricked up his ears and he said, that sounds like the shout of an Irishman. And Deirdre said, no, 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 no. Shout of a, shout of a Scottishman. So they sound very similar. You're from Ulster. You can't tell. And then they heard a shout again and, and Nisha said, that, that sounds like the shout of an Ulsterman. That's that's really, like, uncanny. Deirdre said, no, you're dreaming. Nothing good, nothing to see here, nothing going on. Let's get back to me beating you at this game. And again, a shout rang out. And this time, Nisha recognised that voice. And he said, that is the shout of Fergus McRoy, who trained me as a young boy. Now, Deirdre then grabbed him by the wrist and she said, look... I didn't want to say anything, but I had a dream last night, and it was a true dream. In my dream, a raven flew over from Ireland, carrying in its beak three drops of golden honey. But when it landed, the drops of honey turned to blood. Nisha dismissed her. He went down and the three sons of Ishnuk met with Fergus McRoy and there was great celebration all around, hugs and backslapping and God, we've missed you. And Fergus told him the good news. Crohor and McNessa had decided to forgive the sons of Ishnuk and they could go home. Now they were delighted. They'd family and friends that they had not seen in years. Deirdre, on the other hand, was horrified. She begged Nisha to reconsider, but he wouldn't. She told him that it was disaster he was walking into, but he wouldn't be dissuaded. They all got into that boat and they sailed back to Ireland and Deirdre sat at the back of the boat looking back on Scotland as it receded on the horizon and crying her eyes out. Now, when they landed on the shore, Fergus was immediately invited to a feast in his honour. A guess she was under that he could not refuse. Deirdre was suspicious at this and tried to get him not to leave, but Fergus left anyway. And they carried on down the road 
although she begged the sons of Ishnuk to delay a little while till after the feast so Fergus could escort them, but they would not. They were too eager to see family and friends. And she pointed at the cloud that was hanging over Awan Maka as they came close to it and said, Is it not weird to you that that cloud is blood red? And they said, Shush, that's not an omen. Perfectly normal cloud. And on they went. Now Deirdre at the gates of Awan Maka, she stopped them one last time and she said, Look, I know you don't believe me, but I tell you this now. If we are brought into the house of the king, I will agree that everything is probably fine and I'm just having a moment. But if we are brought into the speckled house, the place where the Crave Rua keep their trophies and their weapons, that is a sign, that is a the sign that Crohor MacNessa means us harm. Now they were met at the gate by Laracum and they were escorted in to the speckled house. Nisha and Deirdre sat down and played a game of Fitchel to take their minds off the feeling of impending doom that was around them. And Lowercombe went back to Coror Nessa, who was still sitting in his house and still brooding over what he was going to do next. Now, he asked Lowercombe how Deirdre was looking. And Lowercombe said, Oh, she's a hag. The wilderness has destroyed her. Her, her hair is like a horse's mane. She's only got about three teeth left. Her body, I don't even want to talk about her body. It's like its like a sack stuffed with rocks and twigs. It's just, it's sad what happened to her. Sad, terrible. And oddly, Crohor felt this burning jealousy sort of recede a little bit and the scales tipped towards forgiveness. But as he sat there and he thought it over a little bit more, he thought, I don't know that Laracum is actually all that objective in this situation. So... He sent another messenger to go and look in the window. Now this man looked in the window at Nisha and Deirdre playing Fidgel. And he was looking at Deirdre with Nisha's back to him. And the way his gaze fell on Deirdre it was so full of lust and avarice that she blushed bright red. And without looking over his shoulder, Nisha knew there was someone looking at her in a particular way. And so he flung one of the chess pieces over his shoulder and with deadly accuracy, because this was Nisha, it flew through the window and it knocked out the eye of Crohor's messenger. So Crohor was a bit surprised when the man came back, minus an eye, but grinning from ear to ear. Crohor asked him what had happened and he said, I lost an eye, but I saw the most beautiful woman in the world and I would lose another eye if I could see her one more time. And at that, Crohor's moral dilemma resolved. He called all the mer- on the mercenaries that he had just so happened to invite to Owen Macker for that particular day. And he told them to surround the speckled house and take the sons of Ishnuk. But the sons of Ishnuk were not easily taken. They fought against the mercenaries in a formation back to back to back with Deirdre in the middle. They made a deadly little triangle and they fought their way out. Crohor went to the druid Kaffa and he asked him for help because they could not overcome the sons of Ishnuk and Crohor was afraid they were going to escape and Kaffa said he would help as long as Crohor swore not to kill them and Crohor said I won't kill them and Kaffa didn't notice the emphasis and he put a spell on them and they felt they were floating in water. They struggled and they kicked until at last exhausted their weapons fell from their hands and they were seized. And then Crohor said I am not going to kill the sons of Ishnok. Who here will? And one of the mercenaries stepped forward, a man named Romania Rough-Handed. He said Nisha had killed his father in a battle long before, and he was prepared now to kill Nisha. But Onlan Ardon begged him not to kill Nisha, because they'd never known life without their elder brother. That... They begged Manya to kill them first. And Nisha then said, No, I've protected my brothers all my life. I don't want to die before... I don't want them to die before me. I don't want the last thing I see to be their death. And so he gave his sword to Manya Rough-Handed. It was the sword of Mananon MacLear, the god of the ocean. And it was able to strike the three heads of the sons of Ishnuk in one blow. And that is just what happened as Deirdre stood and watched. And it was far, far too late when Fergus McRoy 
arrived back in Owen Maka. Now, there was a great battle after that, and half the Red Branch deserted. But Deirdre, Deirdre was taken and she was locked up in a chamber, full of fine things, beautiful clothes and jewels, and Larrican was set to attend her. But Deirdre refused to eat. And over the year that followed, she grew thinner and paler. But it did not make her any bit less beautiful because that was the curse of Deirdre's beauty. Even in grief, she looked astonishing. Crohor Magnessa came every day with sweet words to try and woo her, but Deirdre would not so much as look at him. And after a year of this, he asked her, was there any man in Ireland that she hated more than she hated him? And Deirdre turned to him and said, I hate Manya Rough-Handed, who killed my Nisha, a little more than I hate you. And Crohor said, OK. I'm going to give you to Manya Rough-Handed for a year. And we'll see how he treats you. And maybe you'll be a little bit kinder to me when you come back. He sent for Manya to come and collect Deirdre, to come and get his prize. And the two of them got up into the same chariot with Deirdre in between them. And as they drove to Manya's home, Crohor made a joke that Deirdre was like a ewe trapped between two rams, helpless. Just at that moment, they were passing under a low-hanging rock and Deirdre stretched up her neck and dashed her brains out against that rock. All right. There we just heard the story, Deirdre of the Sorrows, or as it's also known, the Sons of Ishnach. This explains, for those of you who've heard our telling of the Thorn, why Fergus McRoy takes half of the Red Branch and goes to Queen Maeve for the cattle raid of Cooley. Now, I guess the story could also be called the greatest fuck-up of Crow McNassa, but you know. I mean, he kind of has a string of them though, doesn't he? He does, yeah, he has a few. He's not a great king. Eh, he's remembered as being... He's actually surprisingly remembered as being one of the best kings. We had a lot of shy kings then, didn't we? And we must have done. I mean, one of our one of our great kings, under his reign, three quarters of the men of Ireland committed suicide ritually. That was one of the high king things that we found out. I can't remember his name. Anyway, we had some bad kings. Right. Definitely up there with a few of the bad ones anyway. But I guess this post-show chat or post-story chat, we want to focus on the character of Deirdre. And I guess it kind of segues nicely into how we chose to tell this story. And like a lot of the stories you hear when you hear Deirdre of the Sorrows, you hear about a beautiful, passive character that things happen to. So maybe you can tell us a little bit, Sark, about the process that we go through in Candlelit Tales about telling a story, especially the story of Deirdre. Well, we actually kind of developed a bit of a process from your background in theatre which is this kind of idea of, you know, when you get handed a script, Mm -hmm. you have lines. And then as an actor, you have to build a character and a personality out of that. And one of the interesting things about, like, the classical way of telling mythology and folktale is you don't tell the interior parts. You don't say Achilles was sad. You say Achilles wept. So -hmm. it's all enacted rather than interior. It's not about reflection and thought process and emotion. It's about the exterior actions. And so that leaves an awful lot of room for people to read in their own emotional truth into that. So I think what we were looking at was, you know, for a modern audience, it's a little bit jarring to just have the action only thing. This is a very interesting way to put it, actually, because you don't you don't get the novel aspect. You don't get that internal landscape. You have to. So as a storyteller, but then you have to yeah, that. Uh, we, we're, yeah, as a storyteller, I feel like you have to fill in those gaps a little bit. And we, I, I don't want to do it too much because you want to leave room for people to still have their own reactions to things. But, you know, for people who are used to a language of emotion and used to uh, novel reading and used to even just kind of talking about how you're feeling, 
<laughs> in the way that we're kind of used to in modern in modern society mm. uh, and used to a certain amount of kind of psychological um, depth to characters. I think it is kind of helpful to to do a little bit of that work ourselves. And it also helps us decide how we're going to tell the story. OK, so in terms of telling the story, I think, you know, you're being generous there in terms of my own acting uh, or to taking uh, our process from only my own acting experience, because as a as a writer yourself, you get into the the mindset of the character, the protagonist, to True. write a, a story, a novel, and that's kind of how you that's how you write. And I, I guess what I want to ask about is that squeak. By the way, was the heater being turned down? Because we are in the office. We're in the office. Oh, there's birds up ahead. Oh, that's class. Sorry, <laughs> For this episode, Aaron got to listen on the headphones to make sure there was no background noise. And there you is, can tell he's there, enjoying this. There was, if, if you have the speakers up loud, you could just hear a lot of seagulls flying over our head. It was class. Come back, Aaron. Just, sorry. Come back. <laughs> and, and the squeak was the heater. This is fucking roasting in the shafas. Uh, and we're talking about a tragedy. So let's get back onto the... the yeah, the sorry. Crap Solemn. Um, Solemn. <clears throat> yeah, these speakers are great. Anyway, the... So the personality you got to have in in terms of like you get a script, you get a story, you you, you, you get you, you write your own backstory. So how can you talk us through how do we build the personality of Deirdre from what sources and what kind of plot points and what little building blocks that we stick together? So you can you can build Deirdre in a number of different ways. And I think, you know, just to contextualize this a little bit, Deirdre has a particular place in Irish kind of national storytelling, uh, particularly in the kind of Gaelic revival of the early 20th century. There was a whole movement, you know, just in the years before and, and after independence in Ireland uh, that people really went back to the, the Celtic myths. People like Yeats and Lady Gregory yeah. did a whole lot of work on, you know, bringing back these myths. And Deirdre was seen at that time and during a lot of the colonial period as a kind of an allegorical figure for poor, oppressed Ireland. Mm. You know, beautiful and perfect and oppressed and passive and all about dreaming and you just kind of a thing, you know, which is which is I think the the interesting thing about that to me is that the tragedy of the story comes from people teaching treating her as a thing. Yeah. And the reframing that she got by people who were, in their own minds, honouring the Irish tradition was that people treated her like a thing. Right. And now, in terms of that like objectification of women, of, of like seeing her as a status, as a symbol, something to be on the arm of Crowe or McNassa, and so that's, that's one telling of it. And there are other tellings of it, right? So we're far from the only people to reimagine Deirdre in a, in a new way. There are a lot of people working with this material. People like uh, Eamon Kerr and Alan Walsh have done work themselves on Deirdre. Mm -hmm. There's currently a production uh, or play in development about Deirdre based on the Sing version. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, I don't want to claim that this is just us. No, certainly not. <laughs> Those other reimaginings, they've come from... You know, the, of course, Will Sliney's comic book of Cullen, that's kind of a reimagining, taken away from Yeats's essentially kind of maudlin view of it. Well, he had a very particular philosophy about what Ireland should be. And he used the myths in, I think, a very powerful way to try and kind of execute that vision. But unfortunately, whenever you try and get a myth to mean one thing and one thing only, you leave out all of the millions of other things that it means and can mean, which is always a little bit tricky. And I think that's something that, you know, part of the point of having these chats after the show is actually to, to interrogate that a little bit and to not lock ourselves into like, we just told you a version of Deirdre. OK, you know? so again, going back to Deirdre and her personality. So she's grown in the world, grown, she's <laughs> raised in the wild. She's also grown in the wild. Yeah, I I'd like for me, this is an interesting thing about the story as a whole. I very much see it as a clash between wild and tamed, hmm. between raw and cooked. You know, this is this is a young woman who, as you said, is raised in the wild. She doesn't meet a person 
other than Larricum, yeah. her her nurse and satirist. Um, other than Larricum and possibly a deaf and dumb old man who's in some versions of the story, but not others. Creepy old man do. <laughs> like, sounds of it. I mean, I think I feel like he's maybe somebody who got inserted by later retellers who were like, can't have two women in the wilderness. How would they survive? You know, yeah. um, she's she's raised completely apart from society. So she has no interest in this society. She has no interest in the culture of Ulster. She has no interest in the status that she will have as the wife of a king. Right. She's purely driven by her own needs. And she hasn't been socialised, essentially. I mean, kind of. You can, like, if you imagine, like, there's a kind of a persistent idea about, like, kids who are homeschooled being a little bit odd. Like, she's homeschooled up to 11. She's like an only child who's homeschooled by a hermit. You know what I mean? Like, she does not know how to interact with humans, like, at all. Which is kind of hilarious. Yeah, no, she seems pretty socially inept. Like... Yeah, she's stunningly beautiful, but she blushes bright red whenever anyone looks at her. Yeah. Because being looked at is a weird thing for her. Mm. Do you know? And so she's not someone who sees a value in her beauty because she's not someone who understands ugliness. You know what right. I mean? She, she doesn't, she hasn't seen that. She hasn't absorbed that as a kid. It's not part of her, her fundamental programming as a human. In terms of her programming, you mentioned Lowercombe, her maid or satirist. So again, depending on, on the version that you read, uh, her, her maid is usually named, if she's named at all, as Lowercombe. Right. But Lowercombe also has a position in other stories as being a bard and, and particularly a satirist in Ulster. One sec there, no, the seagulls are going mad up there. It's all right. That's gas. They, as long as people can still hear me over... <laughs> Over like, the seagulls. Go on, satirist. What the fuck's a satirist like? So, this is this, this is a like a pretty big role in what? Yeah, and like this is a this was a thing. This was a thing. Satire was not a modern invention. Satire had a very definite and very important place in ancient Ireland, in the society, because there were certain people who were, let's say, difficult to get to through the law courts. And it was a very different system of law. It wasn't common law. It was something called Brehan law, which I know a little bit about, but not as much as I would like. And mm. it's it's a topic that I'm I'm hoping to explore in some depth at a later date. But uh, essentially, it was a kind of a it was a system whereby wrongdoing was restored through uh, a system of fines. All people were not equal before the law. It was very hierarchical. So the higher your status. When you uh, of the person who committed a crime, the higher you're fine. Okay, kind of makes sense. Like tax yeah. breaks. Yeah, kind of, kind of like that idea. Like you don't get tax breaks for the wealthy. You, it's the opposite of that. It's like you, the higher, the higher your your status, the the more you actually have to pay. So the more, you, yeah, if you're a big so, landowner, if you fuck up badly, then you you, you really fuck up exactly, badly. Exactly, exactly. It's kind of actually kind of operates the inverse of how the common law has has sorted itself out. You know what I mean? Interesting. There, no, any politicians uh, listening, the, you know, want to sort that out their kid. Little bit of politics there, for you lads. Um, <laughs> that's not. That's not. We're not, we're not going to go too far into that. But yeah, like the 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 system was. So the the issue with that then was that if you were if you were to say take an action against a king and the king said like I don't accept the ruling of the court, I'm not going to pay. You couldn't really force the king to pay. He's the king. Like. He's the king. He's got all the soldiers. Yeah. And whereas somebody else, it, there could be, you know, they could, it could be enforced on them in, in certain ways. There wasn't really a mechanism except for two. One was, and they both went to the same thing, actually. They both kind of went to an attack on his status and his reputation. So the first was the hunger strike. Mm. You would stand outside his house and starve yourself in public. So anybody going in and out there would see you standing there getting gaunter and gaunter and you could tell them why you were there oh wow yeah so the lads in the 81 hunger strike were singing off the same hymn sheet here and and very deliberately they knew that that was like yeah. that's where they were coming from this this, this was, was um, in our culture for a long time so. this was in our culture for a long time and this the, the H block protest and the dirty protest they were connecting into that culture yeah. and they knew they were they were doing that on purpose um, and yeah that was one of the ways of holding people accountable the other thing was the bardic tradition. So bards had a very high status in ancient Ireland. They were the poets. They were the ones who, um, you know, kept the knowledge going. Mm. 
and uh, there was a particular type of bard that was a satirist and their job essentially was kind of that sort of like not dissimilar to the modern sense of satire of like speaking truth to power in an amusing way right. didn't necessarily have to be amusing but it would get greater traction if it was amusing Class. if you if you make up a catchy song about the king being an arsehole it's going to get sung a lot more than a, a boring song about a king being an arsehole <laughs> And uh, it was an incredibly powerful idea, and like it was, it was also rule bounded. Correct. Yeah, kind of makes sense. Like even modern comedians, like oh, yeah. you know, they're making satire about issues that we, you know, you shouldn't be laughing at really. But like you're highlighting something that's that's disturbing, and you're making it into a satire. You're making it into a joke, and you're making people look at it. Yeah, and focus and, on it. And that's the original meaning of satire. Like, that's the original meaning in our culture of what satire is. And interestingly, there were rules to it. Like, you you weren't allowed to make fun of somebody's appearance, which would disqualify about half of the satire that I've seen in the last couple of years. Do you know what I mean? They dropped a couple of standards. Like, it's it's just, it's interesting in terms of what was allowed and not allowed to be gone after. Mm -hmm. Uh, We might do a whole episode. Actually, I think we might do an episode on satire a bit more in depth in the future. Cool. Because there is a myth about it that's kind of cool. So... In terms of the character of Deirdre, what effect would it have on her to be raised by a satirist? What's that equate to? This is, again, a really interesting thing. Here she is raised in the wilderness, and who do they put in charge of her? Mm -hmm. Only the fucking satirist herself, Lauricum, who obviously is a bard of high status, because she must be to be a satirist. In other stories in the Ulster Cycle, she's she's kind of carries messages, so she's like, she's got a very... Uh, she's got a particular role in that culture like yeah. she's got a certain status there she meets the lads Nishan and Ardan at the gate and invites them in yeah and mm-hmm. like and like she's there are other stories in which she features as a very very minor character mm-hmm. um, I can't think of one at the moment but she's she's kind of like that's that's her that's kind of her job she's also a, a carrier of messages she's someone who's entrusted with bringing messages to other people and yeah she's put in charge of this girl um, and she raises this girl and like part of the raising of children in this culture is telling them the stories of the culture. Mm -hmm. And that was part of an education. And Deirdre is described as being educated, you know, is actually her knowing the legends of her own people, the histories of her own people, the lineages of her own people. But the interesting thing is that although she would have absorbed all of this uh, and I'm talking about her as if she's real now, because that's that's how you do this. Although she would have absorbed all of this uh, on an intellectual level, on an emotional level, this idea of hierarchy and this idea of of like who these people are, Fob off. very much an abstract idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not and something that she's actually immersed in at all. And then it makes perfect sense how she just doesn't follow those rules. They mean nothing to her. Yeah. And when they're invited back to Ulster from uh, High Hill to Alban, or otherwise known as Scotland, she has no interest in going because she hasn't she hasn't left anything behind. And that's kind of interesting again, like she clearly doesn't like the society, whatever about Brian laws, the hierarchy and the status of the king, everything. She's been raised in the wilderness by Lorcombe. She's no interest in being part of this society. She's at home in the wild, yeah? Absolutely. And I think that, you know, when when you uh when you look at that from the perspective of, you know, our kind of understanding of, of men and women and gender role, which is probably a little bit different from, you know, early 20th century Irish folklorists. Hmm. I I would see her as somebody who's quite capable in the wilderness, who's quite well able to take care of herself, to make sure that she's fed and warm and clothes. You know, she knows how to build a fire. She yeah. probably knows how to make a snare. You know what I mean? Like, that's, yeah. it, that just makes sense to me. It's logical hmm. to me that that would be that would be part of her personality. Makes perfect sense that she doesn't want to be queen either. She wants to return to what she knows, what she's good at, and what she's in love with, both the wildness and with Nisha. And she has this prophetic vision of black, white, and red. Mm. Can you can explore I, that a little bit? I loved that. When I first read this as a kid, of course, the first time I'd heard of, of that prophetic vision is, is in the story of Snow White. In Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the queen is, you know, embroidering on an ebony windowsill and pricks her finger. And it's it's the it's the white of snow, the black of the ebony and, and the red of blood. But it's the same three colours. She stole it off in her story. Or vice versa. Who knows? It's a good little trope. <laughs> it's a cool moment. 
But like, I think it also shows that Deirdre has a serious will on her. You know, mm. she sees these three colors. She goes, right. I have had my, you know, early, early adolescent sexual awakening. I'm having that. Mm. Like, that's what I want. And that's it. You know, before she even meets him, she's, she's, decided. she's decided she's made up her mind, and which she- is, again, you know, probably not the most normal and well socialized young woman. Well not the way she actually says it to him, like she goes up and goes, Come on, run away with me. I put a gesh on you, you know, a magic oath that you, you can't break. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. She's not <laughs> That's weird, she's not like, gentle with the lad at all, like kind it's of just creepy. it's a bit full on. <laughs> Hiya, never seen you before. Run away with me. If you don't, disaster will happen to you. Because that's what a gesh means. Yeah. Like she's given him no room. And she's given him no leeway, and it's not uh, its not exactly seductive. Not really, no. There, Deirdre. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the Nisha and La Ardon will just, the fact that she goes away with three brothers, like, and she's lo- in love with the, 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 old, the eldest, the, probably the most handsome, probably the biggest, probably the strongest. Why do the other lads go off with her? Like, what's the, tr- the kind of the triskel aspect of, the, of that character, of the Sons of Ishnak? I think the tripling thing, for me, it's a, it's a trope that you see in fairy tale a lot, which is kind of like again, it goes to that thing of the interior landscape where they're 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 they, they could very easily be read as as aspects of the same character. Mm-hmm. That there's really only one personality there, but there's it's tripled uh, that there are different aspects, and this person, if you read it as one is being led away by the the kind of heart part, the part that wants to be with Deirdre, the part that wants to be selfish. But two thirds of him are going, really? Yeah. Ah. Duty, honour. Duty, honour, family. And, and then the other part of it, I think, is that it's really indicative of the fact that Nisha, unlike Deirdre, has a familial bond that he never leaves behind. Hmm. He's one of the sons of Ishnuk. Deirdre is not the daughter of anybody. She's Deirdre. Whereas he's one of the sons of Ishnuk and so he still has this, he has a status in this culture. He's, and he has quite a high status in this culture. He's a warrior in a culture that really values warriors Mm -hmm. and he's quite high up. So I think there's something in there as well about like the symbology of not leaving behind your family. Like that even if you do leave them, you kind of carry them with you Mm -hmm. and that bond is still there and it's always going to tug a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting. Look at John O'Donoghue and the on on on, on Adam Cara, you know that soul connection that you have with a person yeah. or a or a place. Like you don't have to be there with them, but you can be with them no matter where you are. Absolutely, kinda... there's certain people that you carry with you no matter where you are. My last question is: Why is it okay? Why is it seen as okay for a king to see the baby, to hear the prophecy, and go, "Okay, this isn't creepy." Go raise her in the wilderness. I'll marry her when she comes of age, and you'll all be grand. Why is that not a weird thing? So, in defence of Krahor, which is a weird thing to say after that story, <laughs> but um, in defence of Krahor, the alternative that he's presented with is uh, to kill the child hmm. while she's still in the womb, which presumably involves killing the mother as well. It's not a great option, is if, it? If, if, you know, put in, in terms of that binary, it's not great. I think the error of Krahor is, you know, what we said before, it's treating Deirdre like a thing. And the you ego, know? like the ego jumps up then. The ego jumps up and this idea of, you know, I can have the most beautiful woman in the world. She'll be my queen. No one will dare threaten me. No one will dare, you know, try and seduce her because that'll be an attack on me Mm. and who would dare attack me. So it's definitely an ego thing of like, my status is so great that no one will dare. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 an extraordinary um, blindness as well. You know, for for a man whose whose mother is so influential on him and whose mother is another another story. We'll tell another time the story of uh, Crohor's mother, Nessa, which is wonderful. Um, the not and, gentle one. And very yeah, violent, because very she's violent. very violent. Yeah, she but, you know, for somebody with a mum like Nessa to kind of go, yeah, this girl will obviously be fine with this when she grows up, because she'll be raised in the wilderness, and so she won't form a personality or opinion. But I also yeah. think that that's something that a lot of people 
do with babies, not the child bride thing, but Whoa. the thing of like, Whoa, what? <laughs> like you know, when you when when you t- when you when you talk to uh, parents who have young kids, you know, they'll often be surprised by the amount of personality they have oh, right yeah. out of the gate. You know, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think we kind of, I, I think a lot of us do this when we're thinking about kids, and I think a lot of parents do this when they're thinking about kids. That like, oh, there'll be this child, and I'll teach them all the stuff, and then the kid comes along, and they have no interest in your stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah they don't they'll... learn about their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and going just last topic on on Krahur and. <clears throat> Like his m- massive mistake, we've talked about the, and we'll, we'll get into uh, the other mistakes of Grohor McNassa, yeah. uh, which is basically all of the time. <laughs> but w- interestingly, when you compare it to Greek mythology, what he doesn't do after he breaks his word to Fergus and kills the sons of Ishnak, what he doesn't then do, although he keeps Deirdre captive, he doesn't actually rape her. Yeah, which is a like it's a low bar, but he does clear it. Um, well, like when you compare it to any of the lads in Greek mythology, it's not; it doesn't even come into question. Yeah, there's not even a moral dilemma there. It's just like the 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 powerful do what they want, and the weak endure what they have to. And that's kind of the framing in Greek myth. But I think there's a lot more there's a lot more subtleties and intersections of power going on in in these kinds of stories from the Irish myth. Um, I mean, he he does not do great. He he, you know, she performs a hunger strike which is what she does in the latter section of that. She she refuses to eat. He, she's locked away, so she's not able to do it as publicly as would be normal. Um, and then he basically outsources rape. Uh, he, he hands her over to a man who he knows will rape her. Mm. Uh, though I guess it's a line that Krohor won't cross, which is better than the alternative, though still not good. But she finally manages to take her life back into her own hands. Absolutely. And as the punchline to that really disgusting joke about her being a you between two rams, you know, it's it's this is the thing about the character that bothers me when she's reduced to somebody so passive Mm -hmm. uh, in tellings where she's seen as being very passive and, you know, beautiful and staring into the distance and singing laments and doing basically nothing. She's not. She's incredibly active. She makes she makes all of the driving decisions in that story, except for the one to take them back. And she resists that Hugely. hugely. And then when she is put in a position where she has no choice, she takes the third the third option, you know, she does She does the thing that no one thinks she's going to do. She takes her life. Absolutely. Well, on that very cheerful note, I think we'll call it a close there now because we've just heard the story of Deirdre of the Sorrows and in our post chat we uh, heard a load of sequels. They were loving it. Uh, so in case you're wondering what was going on, it's approximately half past four uh, <coughs> here in uh, the office. Uh, where we're recording this studio, which is not perfectly soundproof. Uh, we're we're no. working on it, but uh, that's when all the seagulls <laughs> go around the place going, caw, caw, caw. they were loving it. They were just Listen, mad for Deirdre today. This is this is Dublin. Seagulls do what they want. They do, yeah. They've it's not actually our city. It belongs to yeah, the seagulls. Yeah. And we're all afraid of them. So we'd like to say a big thank you to Oshin who uh, edited this podcast and also played the music on Deirdre of the Sorrows. Yes, and if you want to keep on hearing these <coughs> stories, um, you know, we have a Patreon page. Um, we like support because we actually do want to pay Oshin for all of the work that he constantly does for us. Oshin, we love you. You're a legend. If you're listening to this, I'm not even sure if he does. He might just do the timestamp. <laughs> This is a question. I'm, I'm this, we'll see if he does or not. Anyway, he'll definitely listen to the story. He loves stories. He mightn't listen to the shite and part. Um, anyway, podcast. Uh, sorry, can, hashtag candlelit podcast. That's what we do with the hashtag. It's actually hashtag candlelit tales podcast. Oh, jeez, yeah. Yeah, yeah. shite yeah. the outro. <laughs> we could redo the take but we won't bother um, we have a website as well candletales.ie we have loads of stuff on there we do loads of stuff we do loads of stuff we do live events but uh, if any of you want to get in touch if you think we were completely wrong about Deirdre or there is a burning question that you have about these stories that we didn't get to send them in uh, if there are stories that you'd like us to tell in future mm-hmm. let us know give us your feedback we love to hear it Absolutely. Till next time, lads. Keep her lit. You.